Jason, uh, it's good to see you again and um, look forward to working with you this year during hurricane season. Could you take a minute just to introduce yourself and what your day-to-day -day role is? Sure. I'm uh, Jason Warzinick. I'm the IT division manager for Boone County Fire, and that's the sponsoring agency to Missouri Task Force One. It's one of the 28 uh, search and urban search and rescue teams uh, throughout the United States. And uh, with the task force, I'm also the IT manager for, for them, but I deploy as a tech info specialist. Great. And uh, uh, Jason, so you're, you've got a background in geospatial and maybe a little bit of IT, but what, what got you intro like introduced to USAR? What, what got you interested? So kind of a uh, long story short, you know, the, you, you hit on, you know, I, I came to this role uh, with 25 years of geospatial uh, experience working at local government. You know, my whole career has been uh, working for local communities. I'm um, trying to, trying to uh, use technology to uh, enable decision makers. Um, you know, geospatial is a, a great tool for that. And so um, when I moved to Columbia um, 15 years ago um, to take a, a new GIS role, um, I pretty quickly met the, uh, the uh, fire chief here at Boone County. And he was the main um, person for Task Force One. And so we got to be uh, working at the local level, you know, doing core addressing and roads, public safety type of stuff. And so jump forward uh, 15 years, um, there was a, uh, the, the previous tech uh, or IT division manager retired um, and uh, he headhunted me. And so uh, that was right about the time that uh, um, they were trying to figure out a way to move away from the Garmin GPS. And so in the background, I've been helping them, you know, trying to bring ESRI's um, new software, um, try it out and, and develop it uh, for the USAR program, not officially, you know, part of the USAR program, but then uh, got really involved in 2017, joined the team um, and uh, haven't looked back since. Great. Very good. And by the way, for the audience, he's talking about Columbia, Missouri, or Missouri, not the country, but you probably <laughs> figured that out when he said Boone County. Um, all right, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, your experience when you deploy. Why don't we do pre-deployment? So um, even even going further back, so you, you got involved through local government. Um, what are some of the different ways, and I know there's variation, uh, one could get involved with either a FEMA task force or even a, what we call a SUSAR, a state team. So uh, every year there's um, openings on these different teams. Um, it, it's a, pretty much a job application interview. Um, they, they look at your background and your skill set. Uh, a lot of the team members are um, public safety, you know, during their day-to-day -day job. Uh, you you kind of have to have the uh, expertise in your bag, you know, uh, for me, it was the background in GIS that was um, something that they were looking for. Um, you know, the, the tech info specialist uh, at the task force level is kind of a position that's evolving. Uh, it used to be just the person who walked around with the big camera and took pictures of the team doing work. Um, they, they've identified that that is not the best use of that position. Um, you know, they, then it moved into... Uh, capturing all the, the GPS data from the Garmin GPS and now um, with the full ESRI stack. So um, you go through the recruit class for uh, Missouri Task Force One. That means you're trained at every position, uh, like an intro level. Um, so we're out there in dry suits, jumping in the, in the river, um, throwing rescue ropes out to uh, other team members. Um, we're, we're in the rubble pile, uh, trying to stabilize it. Uh, you name it. Um, that way, you know, if things get really bad and everybody in the office, you know, that's kind of where I work. Um, if, if things get bad, we're out there right next to everybody helping um, doing rescues. So um, once you get through the recruit class, you know, the, the task force is going to train everything 
uh, everything that you need to know. Um, you get issued all your gear. Uh, and then once you're through the recruit class, then you get into your specialty. So in our case, uh, plans is the division that I'm under. Um, so there's a special FEMA class that you have to go and attend uh, before you're deployable. Um, so it's, it's a lot of, um, you go through the whole process, you learn you know, what to expect. Uh, there's no surprises uh, once you're deployable. You know, and it's in it, and there's constant training quarterly. Uh, up until this point, it's all volunteer. Um, you know, all of our members are volunteers. Uh, um, it's only when you deploy, then you're on the federal clock. Oh, that's really helpful, Jason. Um, and each team may vary. Uh, some teams take civilians, right? Uh, I'm on California Task Force Six, and I'm not a firefighter, but some teams are only firefighters and they'll train someone into those positions. So it does vary, but, um, and then just a reminder, there's the 28 FEMA teams and we'll pass along resources. Uh, there's also state teams like in South Carolina that have a robust task force system and, and it'll be similar to uh, what Jason described. So, yep. Yep. all right, yep. so if you're on a team. Oh, yep. go ahead. Sorry, uh, we, and even though we're a federal team, we're also a state uh, uh, resource. So we do, uh, if there's any flooding or tornadoes or any disasters, um, in, in Missouri, we'll deploy, you know, our, our specialties are uh, structural collapse, swift water, um, you know, so hurricanes is definitely on our list. Um, we, we have a, uh, a helicopter rescue team. Uh, most, mostly that's a, a local asset, uh, but uh, yeah, we're, we're fairly specialized. Uh, that's really helpful. Um, all right, so you made the team. How, uh, how do activation orders typically work? Um, how much lead time do you get? And, and I guess maybe give an example of uh, a short turnaround and maybe one where you have a little more time. Okay, so with the tech info specialist, you know, I mentioned before we're on the plans team. Uh, that's kind of the first team that gets rostered uh, because we've got a, a lot of things happening to be able to coordinate and plan and, and get the team out uh, and, and know where we're supposed to, you know, where we're going, how, uh, all the equipment that we need to, uh, uh, to do for the mission. So, um, in a no notice event, like, a a, uh, tornado, like happened, uh, last year, uh, two years ago, um, in our capital city, uh, Jefferson city in Missouri, uh, it was literally, um, as, as soon as the locals, uh, called up to, to SEMA and put us on, uh, uh, requested us to to uh, respond. It was a, a phone call in the middle of the night. Uh, hey, you know, uh, I need you to come in. So grab your stuff and you're going. Um, and then within about an hour and a half, uh, we were already on scene. Um, you know, one of the first teams to, or one, one of the first uh, crew members to get down there um, to start doing recon and, and getting all the equipment ready for when the rest of the team uh, follows, you know, shortly thereafter, um, and, and then they get out in the field right away. So that, um, so no notice, and then, you know, your typical hurricane season, we, we all watch the hurricanes coming across, um, but we have four hours from when FEMA tasks us uh, to roster the team, um, figure out where we're supposed to go, and get out the door and be on the way. Um, so usually, um, that's a pretty fast turnaround. So 10 o'clock in the morning, we may get the, the call, hey, get to headquarters as soon as you can. We'll be out the door, you know, within that three to four hour window, and, and then we're on the way. So in the case of the Marco and, and Laura hurricane, um, we needed to show up at College Station that next morning at five in the morning. So that means uh, no, no night, right? So you you roster at 10 in the morning and you're going till that next day pretty much with minimal sleep. So that, that's one of the challenges, but hey, it's exciting too. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about, um, we won't go through a checklist because I think we can actually share a checklist with, the, with sure. the participants here, but what's the, when you go, the one thing you always remember that maybe isn't on the official list, anything that comes to mind? <laughs> um, everything runs on batteries. So <laughs> you, you gotta have batteries. Uh, anything, uh, 
you know, your little creature comfort, a little pillow to sleep on, you know, cause uh, we're, we're a very tactical team. So we don't know where we're going to be sleeping a lot of the times. Uh, you know, the, enjoy the, the, ho- the one hotel room you may get, because it may be the last one um, you, you see for a while. Uh, as a techie, uh, you can see I don't go lightly. Uh, this is pretty much all the stuff that a tech info person takes. Luckily, uh, you're not the only one in the vehicle with, uh, you know, because you're a part of the team and, and all of these uh, members that I've run into are all very motivated. Um, so if you raise your hand and say, hey, I need some help carrying this stuff, you'll have twice as many people there helping you. So, um, but you can see when we deploy, the, the goal is to be self-reliant for up to 19 days. So that means everything from food, water, uh, and all your tech. So imagine having to haul, um, you know, a full GIS department. That's pretty much what we have in here. Um, Internet's a great thing, uh, but we can't assume we have it. So we actually have in in all these cases, we have a full uh, nationwide layer of all the structures, um, uh, roads, center lines, all that stuff. Uh, including, you know, the, the software licenses that will run locally. We, we now are getting into drones for the, when we uh, deploy on the state level. Um, but yeah, um, cameras, paper, markers, uh, you name it, all the stuff that you normally use when you're marking up maps, uh, you got to take it, you, know, you got to have it with you or else uh, you're, you're not going to have it. So ink, paper, toner, plotters, you know, as much as, as much as I can grab, I'll, I'll take with me. <laughs> very good, very good. And then obviously your personal gear, uh, yeah. much like Wildland Fire, you deploy with like a red bag ready to go. Um, all right, so now that you're on scene um, with all your great stuff, could you give a couple of quick examples of like the real world problems you're solving? We talked about um, helping uh, get GPSs into the hands of first responders uh, and getting the data off of them. Yep. We've talked a little bit about, we've moved on to uh, field apps like Survey123 and Quick Capture and Collector. Um, but what do you think it's it's helping to address in the real world? What what are you helping the, the USAR team do? So my biggest um, thing uh, uh, that that we bring to the table, you know, is that technology, uh, that uh, that bigger picture awareness. Um, you know, even if we don't have the outside data feeds of, of hey, where's, where's the flooding coming from or what is the current water levels at, at different locations, um, and we can still give them quality maps to help them be efficient when they're out um, sending out their teams, um, the estimating uh, what areas they'll be able to cover. Uh, where do they need to focus their their efforts? You know, is there a uh, hundred houses in this neighborhood, or is there only ten? Um, you know, it. Where are the uh, rivers? Because you know, if we can set up our search grids uh, in uh, geographic kind of shapes that make sense. You know, if you know that river always floods, uh, let's not send our team to try to you know search both sides. Let's have a team go to the north side, go to the south side. So situational awareness, um, processing that data when it's coming back in from the field, um, that's just kind of tactical um, support that we do for the team. But then when uh, uh, in uh, 2018, when we deployed for Hurricane Florence, we actually were embedded in the EOC at, uh, in, in Brunswick County. So this is right where the eye came in uh, 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 and hit uh, landfall. And so we were the only GIS that they had in the county. So that the, the city that we were in and the county, they, uh, they subcontracted uh, or you had a consultant do their GIS. And he was, you know, um, a couple hours away, you know, hiding from the storms. So uh, as 911 calls came in, uh, as their field or as their, their teams needed help, you know, their public works, clearing roads, that type of stuff, I was feeding them maps um, and, and supporting them and giving them, you know, uh, updated results of, of our field work 
for, so they knew, you know, what, where the most damage was. Um, and, uh, they worked, uh, we worked real well. You know, there was, there was times when there was, uh, uh, the flooding caused dam breach. And so that's kind of a quick triage of, okay, what's, what's the hazards downstream? You know, are there any mobile home parks or high density uh, neighborhoods that we need to get out in front of, you know, it's just, um, yeah, you name it. Um, it's got fast paced, uh, long hours, but it's, it's pretty fun. Well, this is great. I think it's giving people an idea of all the potential. I know there's sometimes when you're also just waiting around for a hurricane that didn't materialize, but yep. for the most part, it sounds like a lot of fun. Um, we won't have a lot of time to talk about it today, but this search and rescue GIS community, we've formed, uh, kind of a network and we even are able to help each other remotely, which has made a big difference. So that's something, um, maybe we'll talk about in another presentation, but something, uh, wanted to mention there. And Jason's been a really great resource. Even if he's not deployed, uh, we might tap into Jason for things like, hey, do you have a building data set for the state of Texas? Or can we coordinate with the GIS specialist in this county um, and, and all sorts of things like that? So remote work has um, picked up, I think, in, the, in recent years. Um, let's talk about just uh, after deployment. So. Um, you mentioned it's a volunteer role up until the time you deploy. Mm -hmm. um, what's the type of paperwork at the end? Do you have a task book for your tech info specialist position? Um, so during during the mission, the, the plans department uh, and the tech info, they're, they're responsible for keeping all of a, a kind of a running log of all the missions and all the taskings that we have um, throughout the, the deployment. Um, Daily, we have to turn in, you know, what we did that day. Uh, so meetings, anything notable, um, any any uh, uh, specific tasks that you did, right? So, uh, but after the deployment, then the plans team has to compile all of that, and we do a after action plan. So, you know, take everything that was given, good, bad, ugly, kind of from a hot wash, you know, that we're doing on the way home, and then trying to um, you do that that report and uh, come up with ways to improve. You know, next time we go out, you know, hey, we we had internet, but uh, you know, it took two days to to get into place. You know, why was that? Um, and uh, hopefully improve uh, and and be in better position next time we go out. All right, and then um, one more thing about after deployment is uh, how do you get paid? Like it, in your example. Uh, mm -hmm. You work for local government. How does how does that work? Yeah, so um, I guess I'm kind of a little bit unique where I'm the employee of the the uh, sponsoring agency. Uh, but so while I'm deployed, I'm a federal employee. So uh, I can either take vacation from my regular day job uh, with the fire district, or I just go without pay. And then FEMA um, pretty quickly turns around uh, within probably a week. Um, you know, I, when, when you deploy, you sign a piece of paper saying, Hey, I'm here. Um, and then from that point on, it's, you're, you're paid 24 seven, uh, until you check out after you you know, you get back to the headquarters and, and go through the demo, um, process. So, uh, each position has a different pay rate. Um, you know, so it's just based on, uh, which, uh, which role you have. Um, so if you, uh, if you deploy as a tech info specialist, or if you're an engineer and you're a structure specialist, um, or the plans team manager, um, you know, you got, you, you get the uh, salaries is, uh, compensations kind of, uh, based on, on your role. So, and it's just right. a direct deposit. Yeah. It sounds like it'd be fun enough to do on its own, but getting paid helps, uh, especially to explain to your family why you're going to be gone. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So why don't we why don't we move on to kind of closing out here? So you you mentioned how you got into this. You mentioned that it is uh, hard work when you're there and not always the best uh, living conditions. What makes you go back each season? Um, and I assume you're going back this season, but oh, yeah. uh, what what makes you do it? Uh, you know, giving back to the community. You know, we uh, GIS uh, is, is a a great force multiplier, and and I think. Uh, you know, I've, uh, through the years, I've seen um, 
my the fire chief Scott Olson, who, you know, who's who's the uh, kind of the leader here at uh, Missouri Task Force One. Um, I was come back from starting in Hurricane uh, Katrina, coming back and just with the frustration of of you know they they went to Walmart and got the maps map books and and taped them together. And to me, as a GIS person, that that's like, oh my gosh, uh, no, we, we, we can do better. And so it's, it's kind of a personal drive of, you know, uh, let's, let's not, let's not do paper anymore. You know, we, we, we can do better and we can do so much more with geospatial, right? Um, you know, the, the amount of resources that we have, um, out there that will help the mission, um, you know, and get to those people in need quicker, um, is just immense. So. Well, very good. And uh, for anybody who knows me, I think it's the most spatially inherent problem and, and the coolest public safety GIS application. I'm a bit biased. <laughs> um, one thing, you know, we couldn't cover all types of search and rescue. We focused on disaster response today. We'll post some resources on other ways to get involved. Uh, and, and I'll just mention two. One is uh, if you want to get involved in urban search and rescue, but maybe there's not a team near you, um, some states and also FEMA have cadres that can support, um, that can support either the task forces themselves or the incident support team. Um, and through FEMA, we have a cadre system uh, where you can deploy even as a reservist. So we have people who have other jobs and they just sign up uh, as a reservist and they get called up to support the incident support teams. And that plays a really important role. But um, Again, can't go too far into it today, but uh, vo there's volunteer search and rescue teams in almost every county that has uh, any type of recreation. So mountain rescue teams um, or, and more and more missing persons in cities. And a lot of those teams are volunteer for either your county sheriff or county fire department. And we'll post some resources for you as well. Um, and then finally, My Roots National Park Service is one of the few jobs uh, where you can get paid to do search and rescue. So if you're interested in national parks, um, there aren't that many search and rescue GIS positions, but if you have a GIS skill set and you're near a park, you might be able to get involved with one of those teams as well. So just some different ideas to consider and uh, wanna thank everybody for their time. And thank you, Jason, especially um, for helping get people excited about contributing their skills to this, uh, to this great cause. Great to be here, thank you.